Buongiorno, I'm Dr. Randall Smith and I'd like to invite you back to Exploring the Lands of the Bible. Here we are perched high atop the bustling city of Rome with all of its dynamic activity, the eternal city. We're spending some time traveling the journeys of Paul. Some of you have been with us as we've been uh, in Israel. Here we come back to Rome and the Italic Peninsula so that we can walk with Paul through the journeys of the spread of the gospel in the first century. Just behind me are the Baths of Diocletian that were built at the end of the 200s by literally thousands of martyrs of the Christian faith. What it does is helps to weave the story together of a pagan Rome being confronted with the gospel and at first persecuting the Christians and later adopting their message. So you'll notice our students are from different groups bringing notebooks and studying the places that Paul went places where he was introducing the gospel to a pagan Roman world. Our attempt is to understand that world, to recognize what were the values of a pagan Roman of the first century, and then to apply it into our own lives to understand that as our universities and our schools around the world are rising in their pagan philosophies and teaching them to our young, how will we confront this with the gospel of Jesus Christ? It's been done before and it's been done successfully. So we've been looking at the journey of Paul and Paul's response to the Roman world. I want to share with you today uh, an exciting journey that was put together by Christian Travel Study Programs over the last five years. We follow Paul in the Italic Peninsula, but we do much more. We actually unlayer the ancient Roman world to help our students and our travelers understand the background of the 11 emperors of the New Testament period. All of Lazio and all of Campania today were part of one region called Region 1 of the 11 regions of the Italic Peninsula broken up by Caesar Augustus. Our entire journey, Paul's response to the pagan world, the Roman world, is found in the Lazio and Campania regions today, or the area from Rome down to the Bay of Naples. Why study Paul in Italy? Why are we here to study Paul when he traveled 10 thousand land miles. My feet have been everywhere he went. I have traveled for years all of Paul's places, every one of them. And here's what I know. First of all, this guy was an energizer bunny. I mean, he was, he never stopped. Second, life for Paul was a very difficult experience as a provincial Jew to go to Jerusalem and learn Pharisaism, and then go out into a world with pig-eating pagans everywhere. But his life was brilliantly used by the Spirit of God because he had a Roman mind for administration. He had a Greek ability to write, read, and speak, and he had a Hebrew heart. And that combination made him a unique asset. Paul wasn't writing to us. He was writing to people in his time. So we've got to do a little bit of putting on the skin of a biblical person. Think like a first century Christian. I want you to push your mind to what are the implications of the gospel in the life of a first century Roman? When Jesus came into their life, what changed? And how difficult was the presentation of Jesus in their culture? Let me suggest to you, first of all, you don't need to travel everywhere in the Roman world to understand what Paul is doing. The Romans, if they were anything, were franchisers. So a Roman city is a Roman city is a Roman city is a Roman city. 
They will have the same street layout. They will have the same theater layout. They will have the same bath system. So that you feel like it's good to be a Roman. Everywhere I go, here's Rome, I feel at home. Because the Romans were franchisers, because that's what they did very well, essentially what was going on was they were trying to make a cohesiveness out of something that shouldn't have held together. Now why is that important? Because that happened in the generations just before the message of Jesus. And then people who were barbarians and Scythians and Jews and Greeks and bond and free became one identity in Christ. So the pattern that was laid by the franchising became an important pattern for the movement of the gospel. So in the fullness of time when God sent his son, it means more than just they had Roman roads and Greek tongues. It's that they had a way of making a society cohesive that wasn't a cohesive society. And that's going to be Paul's major tour. He's going to write 13, perhaps 14 letters to try and say, guys, let's get it together. Now, at the same time, not only did Rome make people cohesive, they separated them. That seems counterintuitive, but think about it. It was a very hierarchical society. Everywhere you went in Rome, you knew who you were. You walk into a theater, and depending upon your status in life, that's where you sit. So you knew right away. It was as clear to them as a men's room and ladies' room is to you. Everywhere in the Mediterranean world, because they wanted things to be cohesive, there was a pattern stamp of a city. So we can go to Ostia. We can look at something in Ostia, but talk about something in Corinth. Why? Because it's exactly the same. So we're going to, the reason we chose the area from Rome to the Bay of Naples is the best restored Roman finds in the world are in this journey. When we're digging in Israel, or Jordan, or Syria, or Egypt on Roman sites, and we dig up something, Turkey, we dig up something, the only reason we know that that's a machellum, a market, is because of the ones found in the Bay of Naples that still have the signs on them. So when Mount Vesuvius covered cities, it froze in time from 79 cities that now give us the template of everything else we know. So we chose a five or six hour length journey because it's the template of all that Rome did everywhere. So we're going to talk about all over the New Testament in places that that's not where it was. Do you understand why that was such a hard thing to pull off? Because tourism here developed as a place-oriented tourism. We're not doing that. My interest is, what does a first century believer in Philippi think when he gets a letter from Paul that says this, and they read it inside of a villa in a gathering in the still of the night, and sitting there is not only an equestrian, somebody of a senatorial class with a lot of wealth, but a slave sitting next to them. How? They shouldn't even be in the same room. And they shouldn't meet at night. And to talk about being one in Christ, what does that mean? And so we're going to talk about how tough the message was. We begin our journey with a visit to the Ostia Antica, the very first colony of ancient Rome. And there along the Decomanus, the main street, the east-west center of commerce of an ancient city, we start with understanding a little bit about the background of life and death in the area of the necropolis outside the city. One of the things I think we should stop and do is think about death. Because outside the city, on the edge of the city, remember they're extra mural outside the wall burials? Mm -hmm. So you're extra mural here. When a person died in the Roman period, where does the funeral start? There's no funeral home. It starts in the atrium of the house. Imagine you came in. When you came inside, you would have come into an atrium that would have been a series of porches with an opening to the sky so that there would be an impluvium, like a little pool on the inside. At the back of an atrium was a very special room called the tablinum. Every morning, there was a salutation given by the patrifamilias of the family. And he would come out and he would stand in the tablinum. On the wall would be a series of death masks. And he'd stand in front of a cloud of witnesses, the faces of all of the family before him. It looked like a cloud. I want you to think for a minute. Hebrews 11 is this wonderful story of people of faith. Hebrews 12, 1. 
before this cloud of witnesses. This is something they understood. It's something that they knew. So people will gather in the viewing and they would actually do a procession for that tomb and bring that body out, stopping at the central piazza square or forum of the city and have a laudation given, lauding the person and a eulogy, but the eulogy isn't personal. Your eulogy at your funeral will be about what your great-grandfather did. It'll be the story of your clan, not your story. Because every day when you leave your house, every day as a Roman, the last thing you do before you hit the door is say goodbye to your ancestors, your lares. And every time you walk in the house, before you say hello to your wife who's standing in front of you, you say hello to the lares, your ancestors because they live in your house. Now, the important thing is this. When Paul wrote the, to the Thessalonians, the very first letter we have of Paul in the canon of the New Testament is 1 Thessalonians. And then in chapters four and five, there's really instructional. By the way, I have a piece of information I need to give you. That piece of information is there are three things that should characterize a new believer. Let me give you the third one, your view of death. Some of you have died, Paul says, and I want you to know that those who have already died precede those who are alive when Jesus comes. For, for the Lord himself will descend with a shout, the voice of a trumpet. The dead in Christ will rise first, and we which are alive and remain will be caught up together with him, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So our prophetic view of our future and where we're gonna be changes. Then we walk by some of the period of the Republic and some large warehouses to show you just a little bit about the bustling commerce that was alive then. Okay, now we're standing outside of a, a bath and I stopped for a reason. Lawyers in ancient Rome didn't have offices. You wanted to meet your lawyer, you met him at the bath. Um, most people didn't have independent offices. In fact, you go through places like Ostia and you find actually here it's more commercial, so you find more commercial shop or negotiation spaces. You go to a place like Pompeii and you see almost no offices. There are homes, there are shops, there are no offices. Where did people work? Well, here's something that might surprise you. The average Roman thought would think if we transported him through time, into modern America, he would say, we are a very poor culture. And they are a very rich culture. And here's the reason. They can't imagine spending eight hours a day going to work. Why would you do that? You only need three hours a day of work to get enough bread for your table. And you can't eat more than today's bread. So the whole idea that you would work long hours and put together things and, and try to build industries, it's not that no one did. Here's what I want you to remember. 50% of everyone you saw on a Roman street in the Roman period of the empire was a slave. Half of everybody you walked by was a slave. So let's start by delineating the slaves from the non-slaves. It's all in what you're wearing, okay? If it's tunics, Cut it short, if I see your legs, you're a slave. If you're in a toga, you are a person of society. And your toga's so wrapped around your arm that you can't possibly work because you're holding your toga. So you weren't even designed to work. And there was a special slave that you had carry or watch your clothing and your sturgeon, you know, the thing you use to um, uh, scrape your body to get all this yuck off of it. So you put Crisco on yourself and then scrape it off and that's how you got clean. You had a special slave that stood there and watched your pot and your cloaks. That's the word used of Paul when he was standing there holding the cloaks as the stoning of Stephen was occurring. He was the servant of the Pharisees on that day before he was a servant of Jesus Christ. And that day stuck in his mind all of his life because he was a killer of Christians before he was one of them, okay? So we have a little bit of a, a bath complex here. I wanna go down a little bit further because I wanna get down to the theater. We make our way all the way along to a, a very large theater. Notice that not all the stairs, uh, not all the, uh, the cavea is exactly the same. There are some broader seats in the bottom and smaller seats in the top. 
And the idea is your status in society tells you where to sit. I want you to think, if you want to think Roman, here's how to think Roman. Every time I walk into a building, who am I? Let me put myself in my place because I belong in a place, okay? And, and you never, ever, ever go out of place. The early Christians were arrested for removing the status placing of people. Putting slaves together with people of status was a no-no in Rome. You could be crucified for ruining the hierarchical order. The original charge wasn't about their morality. It was about their meetings and about the essential saying that they were one in Christ. That can't be. We're Romans. You don't do that. We are one as a people, but we're all distinct by who we are. So Paul's themes of there's neither Jew nor Gentile, bond nor free, male nor female, barbarian, Scythian. Romans were affronted by that aspect of the gospel. It would be a very, very difficult thing for them to take. Okay, let's take a little walk across this. We make our way all the way along to see some of the trade guilds. This is called the Square of the Guilds. Because Romans franchised, people lived all over the world, and if you were a tent maker, you'd look for the place where tent makers' guilds were. How would Paul know where he could work when he went to another city? There are markings and mosaics on the floors that help to describe to people which trade guild meets where, and where are the ships coming and going from that have work for people that are working in that day labor context. Can you see behind me two ships, and do you see a fire there? Okay, there's a fire coming into a harbor, and what they burn in a harbor is narthex. It's actually the ancient um, version of black licorice, the anise plant. And the idea is when you burn in a harbor, it means it's safe to enter. But in a Roman harbor, they did something else. They also would offer small uh, handful sacrifices that go with this for the shippers. So even shipping is a religious act. We also walk along its streets and look into its houses, exploring the villa of an ancient world, trying to understand the tenement housing of the 80%. I want you to imagine that it's cold and rainy, and you live somewhere in one of the many, many thousands of tenement rooms. You are in an insulus. An insulus is the word for island. It's a little block of houses and there are seven or eight stories high. Today, we only see the foundations of the houses, and we might see here, uh, you might see in, in, in a business establishment like this, you might see a whole first floor. But I want you to imagine it's cold and it's rainy. You've come down 200 steps with a bursting to full chamber pot. You come down, and in the process, you're picking up your empty chamber pot and putting some coals in a, in a movable brazier so that you can take it back up to your room where it will belch smoke and fill the room with smoke, but it's the only form of heat you'll have. In your room, there's probably a cot, a small four-posted cot low to the floor, and that's probably one of the few things that you own. You live way up top because you have very little money. You have no way to cook. So you have to eat in public facilities like this. Now, the problem with these places is that they get loud. They get brawling. In fact, I can give you no less than 10 citations from ancient literature where people would talk about in the Popine uh, the way people would become obnoxious. And uh, as the night went on, the heavier the drinking, the louder the crowd, right? But this is your social life. And by the way, it's warm in here. To go back to your house means to stop off and, and buy another two coals and carry them up in your, in your brazier. So what you'd find in a place like this is not only foodstuffs and not only uh, drinking, not, not only people in, a, in an active environment, but you'd also find little areas where they would hang braziers during the cold time of the year because they have to take it back and get some cold before they go up to their rooms. Now, we don't see the seventh floor of anything in Ostia, 
But I want you to understand 80% of Rome lived like this. The Roman Empire was filled with people who lived in a single room in the cold. It was a difficult life, but there was always the dream that you would be famous. Now, interestingly enough, one of the uh, places you see this in the New Testament, when you get to Ephesians 5, he says, do not be drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. It's an image that comes from a room like this. What he says is, all the way through Ephesians, he takes you through a regular Roman town and shows you one image after another. And this particular image is, I know that you gather together. I know that it's warm there. I know that it's fun there. But here's what also is happening there. Lewd speech, inappropriate activity, and heavy drinking gives rise to loud halls of wine song. And he said, I don't want you to do that. I don't want spirits. I want spirit to be your song. And I want you to sing to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Make melody in your hearts before the Lord. One of the things he tries to say is he puts a comparison to something that they know and says, you know how that works? This is how this works. The word that holds them together is plerao, the word to dominate. Do not be dominated by the excessive drinking, but rather be dominated by the Spirit of God. Do not let that domination of the drinking lead you to loud, boisterous song, but let the domination of the Spirit of God lead you to songs, hymns, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. So he takes a simple image like this. But 20% of the Romans actually lived in some very nice villas, and we'll explore those as well. Let's take a look at this room over here. Now you can see inside here there's a very nice there's marble flooring here, and then there's the tesserae of mosaics in basalt and in marble. This particular home has in it, in the walls, a heating system, a hypocaust system in the wall. Can you see a side wall there? There's actual chambers, and air could flow through the chambers oh, yeah. in the wall. But this would be the closest you'd get to a, a higher style of living. For the guys who are out working the ports, they're not living like this. You know, this is the, this is the very small percentage. So you're actually in something that's a very upper class, um, not as high as they can get, but in this town, this is a, a pretty nice place. If you're having indoor heating, you're doing okay. You're having comforts. We take our, our journey as our students try to understand public bath complexes and large forum of a city so that they can understand how pagan worship operated when the gospel first came in. We traveled from Ostia Antica and made our way to a mansio, one of the four types of places where you could stay during the travels of Paul. This one was sponsored travel, and we stayed actually along the Via Appio at a place where there was a forum, uh, an ancient gathering place where there were some businesses as people were traveling down the roads and would need to, to fix their carts or shoe their horses or in some way lodge for the night. In the morning, we got up and we made our way across to Spurlonga, a place where Emperor Tiberius, the second emperor of Rome after Augustus, had an incredible villa by the sea, a maritime villa. Just a few years after he had become emperor, he came out here and he was in the grotto and apparently they were having an evening uh, convivial discussion. Everybody's reclining, they're having a good time, and one of the many earthquake or Brady seismic activities shook the place. When it did, part of the grotto collapsed. But there was a guy who was there next to him. His name was Sejanus. Sejanus was the imperial prefect or guard of a personal guard, the bodyguard, if you will. Sejanus threw himself in the path of the damaging stones so that he threw himself over Tiberius to save Tiberius. Well, what did that do? That caused Tiberius to put such faith in Sejanus that the last 10 years of Tiberius' rule, he basically said to Sejanus, you be the prefect and run Rome and I'll go out to Capri and only bring me whatever you know, is really important. And Sejanus became the de facto door to the emperor. He won his trust here. Now, why is that important? Just before the arrest of Jesus in the gospels, Sejanus plotted a coup against Tiberius, and Tiberius found out. Sejanus was killed, his body thrown down the steps, and eventually in the Tiber. 
And with the rise of the coup of Sejanus, orders went out from Tiberius, not from Rome, but from Capri, that said, anyone accused of sedition, anyone involved in any kind of insurrection, kill them. About that time, the trial of Jesus comes up. And a, a provincial gover governor, Pontius Pilate, thinks he has the right to summarily execute Jesus. He would not have behaved as he did had there not been already instructions that said, no insurrection of any kind, put a stop to it. So this cave becomes the beginning of a relationship that becomes the breaking of a relationship that becomes the background setup for the Gospels and the crucifixion. It's a divine providential move and God's hand was in something as simple as a falling stone in this grotto in order to set up a tree in Calvary. Okay? So it's an interesting place, but it's not one that you'd necessarily put together if you weren't looking through the historical data. From Sperlonga, we made our way to Mentorno, a, a small Roman site that very few groups visit, but there's really a lot to offer there. I want you to imagine that as Paul is hearing about these Ephesian believers, at this very same time, he's sitting next to a guy on a light chain who's got lousy duty, who used to be a Gaul, who was transferred to being a Roman. And, and Paul begins to pen out under, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, you know what? I watched the assimilation of people into the Roman world, and I'd like to connect the dot between that and what I'm watching as pagans come to Christ. From Mentorno, we traveled to Cume, a very ancient city, the earliest colony of the Greeks that was in the area of the Bay of Naples. We went to some caves just below the site that were the site of the Cumean Sibyl. She's mentioned in the Aeneid in Virgil's writing in book six, Virgil says that she looked forward to one who would be the king of kings, the prince of peace. And so early Christians believed that she was a prophetess even of Jesus Christ. That's why she makes her way to the Sistine Chapel ceiling because Michelangelo believed that she was in fact a foreteller of Jesus Christ. We know now historically that what Virgil was talking about was actually Caesar Augustus being king of kings, and he was writing propaganda for the early empire. But nevertheless, it was a Christian belief for centuries. We went up above the site and looked around the Temple of Apollo. We even stopped at the Temple of Artemis and looked at the way the various cults were trying to understand the calendar and the understanding of the Capitoline Triad, the three gods, Juno, Jupiter, and Minerva, that were so prevalent in the ancient world in all cities that were stamped out by Rome later on. After a good night's sleep, we made our way to Puzzuoli. Puzzuoli is ancient Putioli of Acts 28. And there we stood at that harbor where Paul first stepped foot on the Italic Peninsula. Welcome to Putioli and welcome to the Italic Peninsula. Acts 25 and 26 tell the story of Paul's arrest and several years at Caesarea. So by the time he's coming here, it's uh, February. Uh, best dating sometime February 8th ish and the landing site they remember it at a little memorial or a stone over there in front of the church there now i want you to think for a moment about the journey from that point clearly people were living in this region under the problems that were going on already seismically there's a brady seismic activity that goes on here this is this is one large four volcanoes strung together and you're actually looking at the rim of a volcano. After our visit to the port of Pozzuoli, we passed by one of the great cities of Italy in the Bay of Naples, Naples itself, the ancient Neapolis. We moved along to where Mount Vesuvius had exploded in the year 79, not 12 years after Paul had been beheaded in Rome. That volcano sends pyroclastic mud and flow down into the Bay of Naples. 
Today, we can go back in time by seeing the sealed up, petrified cities of the ancient world. And we took the time to look at Herculaneum. In the beautiful and wealthy seaside community, we see vibrant color. We saw the temple of the Augustales. We saw some of the nymphaeums in some of the wealthy homes just next to the areas of their atrium, dining rooms, triclinia, places where ancient Romans would have gotten together and had a convivium, uh, a discussion at night. Beautiful, beautiful mosaic tiles set into the walls and floors. Vibrant frescoes jump out at us as we're looking at this ancient city that was quite wealthy. Afterwards, we made our way to Pompeii. This was a more commoner's city. The important thing about Pompeii is there we were able to explore the background images of Paul's writings in places like Ephesians or 1 Corinthians, where you can see a, a whole meat market and understand the background to what Paul was talking about in 1 Corinthians. We entered Pompeii from the amphitheater so that we could talk about gladiatorial contests and the parades that go on as the background of sponsored events by local politicians were put on so that the crowds would come. They would sponsor them in hopes to get your vote. Then we walked along one of the major uh, central thoroughfares of ancient Pompeii. It's today called Abundanza, the Abundance Street. We spent time looking at the ancient cleaning methods of the togas of the first century and walked along even to the brothels that were found there. There were 45 brothels in Rome at the time of Paul. And so we wanted to explore a little bit about what was sexuality like and how did the message in 1 Thessalonians 4 contrast to the pagan view of sexuality. So who's more important in the local church normally, the poor people or the wealthy? Wealthy. Which people would have pleasurable service women, wealthy or poor? Wealthy, because they loaned money. Okay, so here's what I'm saying. Paul said, even though it's legal to have them, it's not right to have them. So that for a first century Roman who's wealthy, who comes to Christ, he has to, he has to hear this. Just because the law makes it legal doesn't mean God makes it right. Okay, why is this an important principle? Because we're coming to a day when the law is making legal things that we know are not right, biblically. So the definition of marriage is done in the scriptures. Jesus said, it was not so from the beginning. In the beginning, there was one male and one female. What he says is that we share our sexual needs are in one circle, our marriage circle. And that's the only place they are to be satisfied, even if it's legal, to do it other ways. So what does that mean about your brothels, about your lupinare? It means that for a person who's going to satisfy his needs or her needs within the circle of their marriage, there are places in this town you're not going to go, okay? One of the implications of knowing Jesus in the first century is that if I'm wealthy, I can't necessarily have pleasurable service women. And if I want to stop by the brothel, which was something I did all of the time before I knew Christ, I can no longer do it. We looked in the main square of the city of Pompeii and there we saw pieces of law courts and uh, major mall centers and granaries, things that help us understand some of the Roman world brought back to life, literally petrified by the flow of the volcano. After our visit at Pompeii, we made our way to the beautiful city of Sorrento. It's a cliffside city. We used it for the port down below to take our way out to Capri in the morning, but that day we simply watched a beautiful sunset on the Bay of Naples. In the morning, we went down to the port at Sorrento, and we took one of those high-speed vessels across to the island of Capri and walked up to the top of Emperor Tiberius's old villa called Villa Jovis. It was a wonderful opportunity as we made our way through not only a beautiful downtown area and a lovely port, but some of us, a few of us, decided we would hike our way all the way up to Villa Jovis to visit the Tiberian estate there, where Tiberius spent the last 10 years as emperor. This is the time period for Jesus teaching his disciples in the Galilee and the ministry of Jesus on even the ministry of salvation on the cross. We know that Tiberius was here between 27 and 37 in the Common Era. I want to take you up. And we're going to go up and take a look at just the, a little bit of the remains of the foundations. We'll see the cisterns. We'll see the official rooms. And then we want to take a few minutes to talk about what kind of man Tiberius was. There is a series of groves and caves along this side. 
And the groves and caves, when I talk about the groves of the nymphs, where he played with sex, that's what this was all for. This was all a garden where he essentially would put children out there, dress them as ancient uh, anima, like numinous spirits. He would t they would become ancient numinas, and they would be like trolls of the forest, and he would dress them in costumes, little children, boys and girls, and he would abuse them sexually. This is what he did. He was trying to find a way to go up from the books to the life, and he didn't have, an, you know, he didn't have video, so this is what he did. This is the last 10 years of his life. He shut down the games in Rome. He shut down the contests in Rome. He pulled back patronage of many of the great festivals. The people in Rome were more and more angry with him. But if you listen to the story of Suetonius, and if it's true, and I can't tell you that it is, I can only tell you that it's old. If it's true, this is a man who had control of an empire, but did not have control of himself. It's interesting that um, the one who is known as the son of God is Tiberius. When Pontius Pilate asks Jesus, are you the son of God? Divi Augusti, the divine Augustus, had only one adopted son, Tiberius. So what he's asking him is not, are you theologically the son of God? He's asking him, do you think you're the next emperor? That's what he's asking him. Are you raising an insurrection? And the interesting thing is what Jesus is hearing is true words spoken of him in a kingdom not of this world. It's almost like Jesus, Jesus wanted to say to him, you have no idea what you're actually saying right now. You have no, you think divine Augustus has a son? You have of him, to him, through him, where all things created and in him all things consist, Colossians 1 says. You're talking about Augustus creating an empire? I created one quintillion stars in a universe, buddy. You have no idea what you're saying. Jesus knew exactly what he was asking. He answered a different he, question. He answered a different question because it's almost like he has to hold back. Well, it's not almost as if. He has to hold back what he knows in every answer to every question. So standing at the edge of the imperial reception halls at Villa Jovis, the place of Tiberius's ancient um, special villa where he spent 10 years. I have at my back the Sorrentine Peninsula, Mount Vesuvio over my shoulder, the Bay of Naples behind me, and the little stretch of water that, that is between the Sorrentine Peninsula and uh, the, the island of Capri. Departing Sorrento, after two nights there, we took the time to go and see some maritime villas. So we're going to see the lifestyle of the richest of the rich, the 1% today. We're not looking at their cities. We're looking at some independent villas called maritime villas and a suburban villa, Villa Suburbane or Villa Suburbana. So we spent some time journeying through one of the important villas, Villa Ariana. It was a, a very important villa of some wealthy patrons that were there from the New Testament period. I want you to remember that the cliffside villas that we're going to go see were like cliffside villas out on the Sorrentine Peninsula are today. The purpose of them was to, to dominate the landscape and sitting up on top of this nice rough cliff. Making our way along the edge of where the pyroclastic flow had filled up and is now a bustling set of cities, we made our way to visit an ancient vineyard and an ancient winery, an ancient winemaking place. This was a Villa Rustica, a, a farmhouse from the ancient period, but it had been now found meters below the surface and you look down into it. So if you had been coming here at the time of Paul and you were walking along, you'd be at that level down there. This is all flow. This is all the volcano, okay? So again, you're down at that level and you're walking along and you come upon a, this is a farmhouse. Classic picture of a farmhouse of what Paul would have seen sitting out on the side in many places. This is just one we found. They have two kinds of presses here. They have an olive press and they have a wine press here. The interesting thing is that it takes for one press you need, uh, one press will handle about what 20 acres can do. So if you have a, a big winch style press, that means you probably have at least 20 acres. Do you see the dolio? They're in the ground there. Those are fermentation vats. 
You cannot find, uh, you won't see any like that elsewhere in the country, all organized in their original fashion. So this is the only place you can see this. Right next door is a little museum called Bosco Reale. And the little museum exposed for us daily life in the Roman times, daily life from the time of the New Testament. One of the only places you can see the petrified actual fruit in the fruit bowl that was covered up by pyroclastic flow when Vesuvius erupted. We also wanted to see the tools of a doctor's office or just the normal kinds of things that would have been a part of a bustling city from the time of the New Testament. Afterwards, we made our way to the Villa of Papea Sabina, a very important villa because this was Nero, Emperor Nero's second wife. So you have the compluvium and the impluvium here, and you have a large open atrium. You get the feeling that this is almost royalty, right? Now someone asked, did she survive Nero? No, what she did do was she was pregnant with his baby, and he kicked her to death and then wept because he felt that she was a really decent wife, and he didn't really know why he did that. When you think Nero, think this building, because this is the woman he's taking for his second wife. After a good lunch, we made our way back toward Rome. Traveling north, we stopped off at one of the most significant monasteries ever created by uh, the ancient Christian world. This one was a monastery of St. Benedict, Monte Cassino. High above the plains around, this was the largest monastery of Europe. And we spent some time talking about the rise of the monastic movement. There's a, the Benedictine movement is probably the single greatest scholastic monastic movement in Europe. For literally hundreds of years from the sixth century onward, it, were the, it was the message of the Benedictines that brought the gospel. It was the message of the Benedictines that brought order to the church. They were concerned that people were experiencing God in the church, but they weren't knowledgeable of the text of Scripture. And the Scriptures hadn't been printed, so Gutenberg's not been around yet. So there needs to be an educational process. We also wanted to take a special amount of time there and talk about not only did uh, Rome experience Christianity, but Christianity experienced Rome. And Christianity was transformed and Romanized. And for many people today, the form of Christianity they know is much more Roman than it is Christian. Next, we made our way to Rome. And for several nights, we spent some time in the Eternal City, surrounded by the beauty and the sights and sounds, the smells of Italian food on every corner. We had the opportunity to look at how Paul, when he came into Rome twice, first in probably 61 to 63 for his first meeting with Nero, staying at San Paolo alla Regola or someplace in that area near the Tiber River, writing uh, letters like Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. We, we discussed that. We, we looked at his background. We, we asked the question, where would Paul stay? What were the conditions under which he would stay? We were moved to find that there was nearby to the synagogue remains of an ancient synagogue, and nearby to that remains of an ancient area where cloth workers would have worked. And in those areas, we would place the Apostle Paul waiting to speak to Nero. Down in the dark caverns now, because the excavations are covered over by modern Rome, we spent some time talking at San Paolo alla Regola, this area where Paul would have done that early writing. Maybe it wasn't the room we were in, maybe it was one of the rooms of the five chambers nearby, but large buildings were found underneath there. Unfortunately, only a slice of one of those buildings is now uncovered and visitable by our groups. So we spent time there. Paul didn't only visit Rome once. In fact, when he came a second time, it was after the great magnum incendiary, the great fire of Rome. And as a result, even the areas of the Hippodrome and the, the great Circus Maximus were under reconstruction. What you're looking at with 600 by 100 yards roughly of this long race course is a very important place. A quarter of all of Rome could be here. I like to think back of Paul coming in underneath where the umbrella pines are. And as he walks in, all of the area that he's seeing back there, much of the area behind him over here, this area here, what's behind me here, a lot of it was burned, a lot of it was under construction. This was now, he's three and a half years later, 
and the, it took them about 10 years to really rebuild the city. So they're part way through a reconstruction. Lots of camps, lots of guys with chisels working, lots of public works going on trying to recoup the thing. Paul will come here twice. Once he'll come in about 62. The next time he comes is in 66, 67, and he dies in 67, 68. What's the difference between the two? In Philippians, he's writing 62, and the fire of Rome hasn't started. In 66, 67, when he comes back, it's been burned, and Nero's in the attitude of blaming Christians. And that's the difference between the two times Paul visits. And so we spent time looking at the ancient forum of Rome and the Colosseum of Rome and looking at the areas that were, by the time of Paul, burned up as a result of the fire of Rome and under reconstruction. When you see the Colosseum, it's a symbol of Rome. But what you should remember is, it is a symbol of Rome after the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. And the fall of the temple of Jerusalem was the rise of the Colosseum. The temple was destroyed. The gold was liquidated in, in the year 70, and the upper Jewish quarter was liquidated, and soldiers were given opportunities to take a certain amount of the spoils, but all of the rest went into the public coffers, and this sponsored the building of this. The money that Titus made from sacking the city of Jerusalem was used to pay for the Arch of Titus and the large amphitheater, the Flavian Amphitheater we call the Colosseum today. We also spent some time understanding what happened to the early Christians, what they paid to be part of the body of Christ. We looked in the catacombs and in the particular ones we were looking in, we were looking for some of the early Christian symbolism and how early Christians expressed themselves. Many, many early believers had never seen their name written out anywhere. And in fact, they didn't want their name on their burial. They just simply wanted the sign of the cross because to them, the most important thing would be that they would be raised from the dead. We also looked at a very, very lovely area today, the Three Fountains, an area that recalls the beheading of Paul. This place is so beautiful, people just want to stroll. I see, I see. It's today a Trappist monastery in a very serene environment with gardens around it. But for Paul, it was a much harder place to see. There are a variety of traditions for how Paul's life ends. All of them are that he's beheaded. All of them are that he's beheaded after he has come, staying in Rome, imprisoned in Rome. He's taken to the Pomerium, the wall of the city. He's beheaded in an extra mural beyond the wall execution. Do I know if Paul died here? No. What I know is he died. Do I know if he was, his head hit the ground here? No. But I know somewhere near here, outside the walls, it happened. And this is where Christians have cho chosen to localize the event. Remember, standing on the right spot isn't the whole thing. It's remembering what happens that's the whole thing. So we want to come take a look at the three fountains. Guys, this is considered the Alley of the Martyr, the Alley of Paul's Martyrdom, but it's actually alongside of this one where you have lots of other martyrs as well. So it's called the Alley of the Martyrs. The place for Paul's execution is at the other end of this. If, if Paul hadn't seen Jesus and actually spent those years learning from the risen Christ, do you think really he would be willing to lay his head down and say, take my life? I don't think so. I know people. And if I didn't really see the resurrected Christ, if I didn't know he was alive, I wouldn't be willing to give my life. Guys, listen to me. As persecution rises, we must again reclaim the understanding and the realization of the risen Christ and his power. Paul said, I want to know him. And I want to know him. I want to know the power of the resurrection, but it goes with the fellowship of his sufferings. You can't take them apart. My heart bleeds for a church that has been taught about wealth, health, and prosperity because they have bloodlet us to the point where we are anemic and now persecution comes and mass numbers will walk out the door because they don't have what Christ is really all about. He will change your life, he will change your destiny, and he requires your all.
Now, I'm going to take inside, and I don't talk inside the church at all, in my own respect for the church. There's clear artwork in the church. All of it is more contemporary to you than to Paul. But I use this place as a quiet place to reflect on those who went before us. And listen, those who are going right now. There are believers being persecuted all over. I am praying for people in Syria today. I am praying for people in Egypt. Egyptian churches, more than 40 of them, burned to the ground this year. Persecution isn't an ancient thing. It's going on now. So I use this place to quiet, to get quiet before the Lord and pray for those who are living in hardship. After Paul was beheaded, his body was placed in a tomb, his head separated, and sometime later, early believers moved his remains over to where they are now, below the church of St. Paul outside the walls. Early Christian tradition tells us that the, the martyrs of the faith were remembered. Peter on the west side of the city, Paul on the south side of the city. These who had died for their faith and these who were, had spoke so brilliantly of Jesus Christ. Whenever you see Paul, he's standing there with a book and a sword because he was one who brought the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, to the people. Whenever you see Peter, you see him standing with keys because he holds not only one key, the key to the temporal life, but he also brought the message of the gospel, the key of the afterlife. And so what we have are Peter and Paul coming to this city of Rome. One of my teaching partners took our group to see uh, modern Rome's beautiful attractions. Some of the cathedrals are unbelievably stunning. They saw the St. Mary Major Cathedral and St. John Lateran, the seat of the papacy for generations. St. Peter's, the largest Christian cathedral in all of the world, is located in Vatican City, just attached to the side of Rome. The Vatican is 100 acres large, half of it are gardens. We are like to, to bring you to the original part of the museum, then we move through the main galleries and we go to see the Sistine Chapel and, and then St. Peter's. This is the biggest museum in the world, ladies and gentlemen, when we look only three minutes to average artwork, we need four years. All these galleries get built, typical for Renaissance art, interaction in between architecture and nature. It was all open. Here we have more than 2,500 faces. I don't present you all of them. Okay, okay, one room of Raphael. It's nice. Huh? And then we make a break for the Sistine Chapel. Uh, Raphael is called by Bramante, friend of him, architect of New St. Peter's, to paint these rooms uh, becoming apartments of the Pope. He painted here from 1508 to 1510. These two years are considered high Renaissance, rebirth of the ancient time, overgrowing of the Middle Ages in knowledge, in painting, in reading and that's the idea what we need to know the Sistine Chapel built by Sixtus IV there simply is coming the name from built in 1481 by Baggio Pontellinus this Pope is uh, calling Umbrian and Tuscany artists uh, to paint the side uh, walls uh, so on one side uh, the Old Testament on the other side the New Testament years later Michelangelo is coming to paint the ceiling I'm sure the most famous scene when only one finger is giving energy to Adam. And that's uh, the beginning. Then we have Sibyls. Do you know what Sibyls are? If you go to Greece, if you go to Delphi, you visit the oracles. Ancient mythology. The Sistine Chapel is the place uh, for the election of a pope. St. Peter's has almost 2,000 years of history. In this direction, 36 feet underneath, we had the circus of the Emperor Nero. In this circus, Peter died as a martyr, being crucified upside down to not have the honor to die like uh, Jesus. And this tomb was honored right after his death, and a little later, only 30 years later, with a little tropaion, a kind of an honor altar on the top. But they also got to see into the Roman past, all the way back to the second century and the, the building that was built called the Pantheon, which later became a church. Ladies and gentlemen, the Pantheon for me is one of the most amazing buildings you can go to. You know, Pantheon means all God temple. To come in, you have an unbelievable impression of space. Because this building is the most 
perfect geometrical form. The sphere, height and diameter are exactly the same. 130 feet height, 130 feet diameter. So if you take the dune, which one is rising up and is down below, it's touching the floor and you have the sphere. This was the world idea the Romans had. The world was round seven deep niches. We're standing for the seven planet divinities. Jupiter, Venus, Mars, Mercury, Saturn, Sun and Moon were considered the planets moving. Uh -huh. Moon day, Monday, Sunday, uh -huh. Saturday. Sorry. Only to give you the English versions in Italy, or in Italian, in Latin, it fits for all the seven ones. Look what it is. Huh? So the circle, the sphere, the world, the astronomy, the seasons, all gods and all the world system in one. That's for me a very important issue, even to understand the Roman knowledge and background. We speak about the Koine, we spoke about what the Romans took from all over the world and it, but this is one of these uh, essences of the Roman knowledge, you can see. And it's still there, that's why it's so lovely to see it. As a, to give an idea about, floor and wall decoration is still original, going back to the second century AD. That's exciting. The little ediculas, they were standing for gods and goddesses on choice. The Romans had enough to put uh, in. The dome, which one is rising above us, ladies and gentlemen, is the widest dome in the world. And it's done in only one pour of concrete. If you go out, straight right across a big street, you are falling into the Trevi Fountain. One of the exuberant, joyful spots in the north end of the city is the Trevi Fountain. And the groups delight as they come and they recall all of the water that made Rome so important and so vibrant in the ancient period. Our journey really has been about Paul. It's been about the Roman world and Paul's incursion into the Roman world, his invasion, if you will, with the life-giving truth of the risen Christ and how Jesus changes a life. And what we hope that you will learn through the series is that you'll understand Paul walked into a pagan world and confronted it with the gospel and that gospel permeated and changed that world, but something else happened. That world also changed the expression of the church. And in some ways, it brought with it a very Romanism to Christianity that needed to be corrected later by believers that would take you back to the word and back to the book and away from some of the laden traditions of Rome. I'm Dr. Randall Smith, and it's been our privilege to journey together through the Italic Peninsula to learn a little bit about Paul's going with the gospel to the Roman world and confronting it, Paul's response to a pagan world. Today, we just wanted to share with you some of the highlights of our journey, but as you continue watching our series, you will see that we will zoom in on various aspects of the pagan world to help unpack what Paul was walking through as he was walking through the Roman street. As we continue in our series, we invite you to walk with us through the journeys of Italy as we explore the lands of the Bible.